Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to wake up from your dream state, then do we have the Way of Liberation show for you. Today I'll be talking with a spiritual teacher, Adyashanti, author of two of the most beautiful and important books I've ever read, Falling into Grace and the Way of Liberation. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about a practical guide to spiritual awakening and enlightenment. That plus we'll talk about becoming the stove, merging with dresser drawers, Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments, the importance of St. Patrick's Day, backyard huts and giving up, the dangers of window shopping, and what in the world bicycle racing has to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Adia. Are you ready to shine? <laughs> Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here with you. Well, thank you so much, Anna Mighty, woohoo, for having you on the show. Before we dive right into things, I can't resist. Where were you, and did you do anything special for the eclipse? You know, it's funny. I had planned to be there for the eclipse and poke my head out the door and take a look at it, and I was sort of anticipating it for the last week or two weeks. And then I went to pick my wife up from the airport, who was coming in from a teaching trip to Europe. And I hop in my car and I realize it's 2.30. <laughs> at that moment, I realized I, I think I missed it by about an hour. So, <laughs> so with all my anticipation, uh, I somehow managed to, to forget all about it. Well, you had priorities, wife on mind. <laughs> yeah. Very, very good. So let's let's go from there. Let's go into a time machine. Let's go way on, way back when. I want to talk about what you started noticing as a child, and were you really seeing that adults were insane? <laughs> yeah, it was one of the. I think I've I've heard a lot of people when I've told this story that that have really found a resonance that they saw something very similar. At least the part of the the human world or the adult world from the eyes of a child, like I had which was there was lots of it that didn't make sense to me. And a lot of the parts that didn't make sense was I was a great, I was a great listener. I love to listen. I like to eavesdrop, you might say, on conversations. And I would notice that there was a fair amount of the ways that adults related to each other that didn't make much sense to me. Um, you know, even as a young child, I could tell in a conversation where one side tried to manipulate manipulate the other side or start to strike controlling the situation or the or the conversation and I could see all this and be aware of it from a very very young age I think a lot of kids can much earlier than their parents think they can and so it created a question like what's going on with this world of adult communication there seems to be so much of it that's so odd that doesn't add up and I went for months, weeks or months, having this question, like, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on with this part of the adult world? And one day I had this little epiphany. And the epiphany, which really allowed me to settle and feel so much more comfortable, was, I get it. They're insane. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, which doesn't mean like everything of the adult world did in, was, it was insane. That there was a part of it that I realized I actually didn't didn't add up there was there was a kind of yeah there was a kind of insanity to it and like i said i've talked to lots of people that as little kids had their own version of that may not have used the word insane but had some way of thinking that for me it allowed me to really relax because i just felt like now i understand so i could put the whole issue behind me it was like great for a lot of people that realized the same thing what they told me was that they almost had the opposite reaction, that they figured something must be wrong with me because I see, you know, they can't be insane. They're, they're taking care of me. They're the adults. Or so therefore there must be something wrong with me, which is frightening. Or my God, if they're insane, that inherently terrified them, right? Because now I, I'm dependent on adults and I see this sort of fundamental flaw in the 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 adult character a flaw which by the way as adults we share right? um, 
And so there's lots of different ways of responding to that. But for me, it was very, very positive. I could just relax, put the old issue to rest. Well, it sounds like you had you had a very independent spirit, at least in t on the inside growing up. And so you saw them as insane and you go, okay, don't have to worry about that one. It's not me. I'm going to save myself thousands in, in uh, psych bills later on. <laughs> and I'm just going to go about my business realizing that they're way too attached to their thoughts. Yes, exactly. Now, of course, the, the benefit that I had was, even though I could see, see that, the, basically now I would say, yeah, they're attached to their thoughts. They actually really truly believe what they think. Um, the advantage I had was I grew up in a pretty good family. You know, I had parents who loved me and cared about me, and it, I wasn't in a sort of destructive, situation or you know had parents that weren't caring or, un, or unkind I, probably one of the reasons i could rest with that in an easy way was because i felt very secure in my family you know that very makes secure sense. in the love that i that i was receiving and even in that family situation you know as a kid i could see by god they actually believe believe their own thoughts you know what a from a child's point of view that's that's a really odd thing because for a child, the thoughts are also quite so fleeting. Yeah, they're so fleeting, and a child is in a very imaginal realm, mm -hmm. and so they're using their we're we're using our thoughts and our imagination in this very fluid way, and in one sense, we can really go into a place where that whole imaginal world seems very, very real and very believable. But at the same time, I think as children, we're also very aware that we're using our minds and our imaginal world and our thoughts as play. That we actually know what we're doing. And in the adult world, we often lose the sense that this is play. We, also, we start to think that, no, this, is, this isn't just play. This is, this is real. You know, that what I think has some sort of final um, substantive reality to it. Scary, you know, it's almost it? be like Yeah, it would be almost be like a child who's imagining and then thinks that whatever they're imagining is actually objectively real. I think it would be, from a child's point of view, it's very much like that. So did you have much of a spiritual sense growing up? I did. I did. Not a huge religious sense, mm -hmm. although religion intrigued me greatly, but I didn't grow up going to church on Sundays and all that kind of stuff. But of course, spirituality was a big part of the broader family conversation within my family, within our extended family of grandparents and all that. Um, and certainly in my own personal experience, I had things that when I was young, I didn't think much about because they didn't seem odd to me. But when I grew up, I realized, you know, I had lots of what would be considered kind of mystical experiences when I was a child. I think as children, we just assume that everybody's having those experiences so they didn't even stand out as as you know particularly ex, um, significant they were very comforting and sometimes also very baffling but um, I never thought that they were particularly unusual but spirituality always held as long as I can remember it always held a, a deep place of intrigue you know for me yeah, and me as well. I, I'm, I was fascinated that you were into uh, Charlton Heston and uh, Ten Commandments. I was a kid who went to Hebrew school and then to Catholic high school and, and many other religious schools in between. So it was fun to step back and kind of look at it as, as different games of chess that people were playing. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's different ways that people are, are really articulating. Mm -hmm. You know, something that's very, I think, instinctual for us. The spiritual impulse, I think, is one of our deeper, deeper and most profound instincts. Yeah. So if we go from there, and I'm going to double back, I'm, I'm intrigued about bicycle racing. I'm going to get there in a second. But if I, if I skip ahead of that, can you tell us, I believe it was a book by Alan Watts. What did you hear about first come into your, your, uh, uh, into your ears, I guess, at 19? Well, this is the strange thing, Michael, is, yeah, I was reading a book by Alan Watts. I'm not sure which one of it, the books it was. Um, it might have been the book he wrote on Zen, but mm -hmm. it, was, it was reading about Zen. And I just lit just read the word, enlightenment. I didn't really know what that word meant. I, I suppose I'd heard it, you know, but it had never been a word that meant a whole lot to me. But some reason when I read it in that book and probably within the context of some of the stories that were being told, the old Zen stories, I suppose, 
but I read the book and it was literally like almost like some sort of an explosion happened inside of me. And almost as fast as you could snap your fingers, I suddenly realized that the entire trajectory of my life um, had just shifted. I didn't know what that meant, what it was going to look like, how it was going to unfold, but I intuitively knew that I now have to, I'm compelled with, with or against my will to find out what this word means in my experience. Why I, why that happened, I don't actually know. Why it was so powerful so quickly and why it you know, just sort of took over my whole life um, so dramatically, I, I really couldn't say why it happened, but it was a, one of the more odd things that did happen to me in my life. Well, and it's fascinating too, because now going to the, the bicycle racer, which we, sh we shared off air, we both share a, a, a common love there. Bicycle racers are, well, inherently we're slightly neurotic and we work very hard and we often get tunnel vision. Um, and the reason that I'm saying this is because you took your training skills on the bike, as if I understand, and, and you dove into quote unquote enlightenment full on. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good observation because I took I took what I knew, you know, I took the skills that I'd learned from cycling and and the necessity of putting yourself completely into a com training regimen, which I'd learned those skills much earlier growing up as a little kid being dyslexic and realizing the only way I'm going to you too you know, learn how to read and catch up with everybody and math and stuff was to just outwork every work super 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 hard and that's what I learned. So I applied that to bike racing and it worked. And so I just naturally fell into that mode of being and in, in my spiritual search. So before you knew it, I built a little meditation hut in the corner of the backyard of my parents' house. And I, um, I was meditating hours a day um, for, you know, for the next <laughs> 14 years. Yeah, I, I was really just thrown completely all into it. It was even more of an obsession than, than bicycle racing was or had been. I could see that. And if I had understood what I understood now, I probably would have gone down that same path. It's intriguing, particularly around 25. You're going for it with everything. You're going for it. You're going for it. You're going for it. Why did you call it at that point a practice of failure? Well, because I had been pushing so 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 hard that I for about the about a year before that from maybe the age of 24 mm -hmm. I was pushing myself psychologically so 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 hard that I really felt like I was on the edge of almost like a kind of I used to wonder literally walking to work where I worked in Palo Alto California each day I used to wonder is this the day that I just sort of have some sort of psychological break because I had you know put so much um so much pressure on myself to have some sort of breakthrough. And um, so I've been feeling that way for some months. And, and um, at 25, one day I just sort of had this conviction, like I have to have some sort of a, some sort of a breakthrough. I have to. And then, so I went in my backyard and in, in my little Zendo in the middle of the day, which is not when I would usually go in there. And I just thought, you know, today absolutely has to be the day or I'll go insane or something. Who knows what would happen? And I sat down there and I like I kind of had the culmination of these years of intensity and intense focus and practice. And somehow they all rose up in one moment. And very suddenly I just realized the truth, which was the defeat part. Um, I just realized I can't do this. It was like all of the failure culminated in just a moment of kind of a kind of realization, not the kind that we look for, but nonetheless. And I knew it with every fiber in my being, like, I cannot do this. And as soon as I sort of said that to myself as I was sitting there in my full lotus position um, and felt it very, very deeply, that's when this sort of um, explosion of energy occurred. You know, that's when something really, really like the the like the whole ground I was I was on was shifting. There's something so incredibly special about the 
non-chase, the giving up of chase, the surrender of the chase? Mm -hmm. You know, I'd been told by my teacher, you know, um, uh, to, to relax, to, to let go of striving so hard. And, you know, she tried to tell me in a hundred different ways to do that. But the truth is, at that point in my life, I was simply incapable of doing that. I was incapable of really deeply understanding what that meant. That was my default mode. If I wanted something badly, mm -hmm. I, I pushed myself to, to the edge. So, you know, I, it's kind of like you, you thought, well, if I could have, you know, relaxed earlier, but at least in my case, apparently I needed to go through all that, you know, so I could just let go and, and stop chasing so hard. Some people don't need to do that. They don't need to go through all that, um, which is like, that's the good news. But apparently I did. I've had uh, two near-death experiences I mentioned before. I call them cosmic guidance with a two by four. Out of those experiences has come my continuous mantra, which is kind, gentle, easy, good. I wish for everything to come, no stress, no striving. Doesn't mean I'm not focused and, and working towards something strongly, but kind, gentle, easy, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say that that that's a very similar to my the attitude that I that I suggest. You know, actually, after that moment, that's the attitude I came away with. You know, that that all this this struggling, struggling, and angst and effort, and you know, I gotta have a breakthrough and all this kind of stuff. That even though it's coming from often a very authentic place within us, that it's it's actually getting in the way. And sometimes the understanding that like I'm getting in my own way is can engender a kind of letting go, a kind of allowing things to happen. Because I think for most of us and probably most of the people listening to this is so often the best things in life do happen when we kind of let them happen. They seem to almost happen, happen to us rather than us making, the, making them happen. Yeah. Thank you so much. If, if we go, to, go back to that event at 25, mm -hmm. what was it like immediately afterwards? And then how did you, to me, the, the key word that's difficult for people who have, I don't even know I can call them similar experiences. I can't say anybody's was like yours, but integration challenges. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> first thing, what I, what I came out of this sort of, in, in, so you mentioned near death. In a certain sense, it was it was a death experience. That's what it felt like. That's what it internally. That's what I feel like I went through, is a, a real death. And a part of me literally did die. In fact, for years since I was in my late teens, I had a premonition that I was going to die at 25. Wow. And I always was completely convinced it was going to be a physical, actual death for many, many years. And the strange thing was, it never concerned me. I used to even wonder, like, I wonder why this absolute conviction that I won't make it past my 25th year isn't disturbing me. <laughs> it was very odd. For a lot of years, I was convinced. And so it ended up not being the death I imagined, but certainly a big chunk of me did, did die and didn't make it past 25. Um, but after that, of course, what I realized is that there was a part of me that was absolutely deathless or timeless. And for at least that part of my life, um, that little chunk of the realization that I was deathless and timeless, it kind of took all the fear out of me, mm -hmm. all the existential fear, which is actually kind of a dangerous thing to do to a 25 year old kid. Right, because <laughs> it doesn't mean that you suddenly grow up, right? Become a forty-five-year-old person. So I was a twenty-five-year-old kid with no fear, um, some wisdom around it, around some caution around not to overuse it. But um, the integration from that point was, to be honest, I would say the next six years or so were were some of the more difficult years of my life actually, just in terms of getting myself in situations that were fast and radical growing up situations, mm -hmm. um, the kind of things where you grow up really, really, really fast or you, or you sink. Um, and none of it was malicious, none of it was ill-intentioned, just I think that fearlessness um, unconsciously got me into certain situations that a little fear might have 
kept me out of. Um, but looking back, I look at them as some of the most amazing years of my life in the sense that I felt like I had lifetimes of growth condensed into a very, very short period of time. A lot of it was very, very humbling. I can't mm -hmm. look back and say, here's the very wise ways that I integrated what I experienced at that time in my life. That's not what that period was comprised of. It was more like, you know, very humbling moments um, that were kind of eroded in a certain way. What it, pieces that were left of conditioning or ignorance or, you know, all sorts of things got uh, got lived out and and fell away during the next probably five or six years. I heard you even had a, a very rough relationship during that time that you called the spiritual fast track. It was. It was the fear of spiritual fast track. I think probably a lot of people have had the experience of being in a relationship that, from one point of view anyway, that you kind of have no business being in. It's the wrong person at the wrong time, and you know, and yet. There, I, I was in it, and it was, you know, very, very intense and extraordinarily challenging and extraordinarily difficult. Um, and in that sense, it was, uh, you know, I was on like a, yeah, super highway of evolution if I chose to, <laughs> to eventually see it that way. And after, I mean, it all played out relatively quickly in probably a year and a half period of time. Um, but when I came out of it, number one, what I what I came, what got me out of it was realizing that the only thing that got me into it was a lack of living the truth that I knew, mm -hmm. and the only thing that was going to get me out of it in a wise way was living the truth that I did know. Um, and coming out of it, I really it shedded or unceremoniously stripped away. You would probably say a lot of layers of false identity which a very vivid memory at, at a certain point shortly was after that I really just felt like, wow, I have no idea who I am anymore. I felt like any mask I'd ever worn was mm -hmm. torn away and on the ground. And I realized I really like it. <laughs> really, really like not having any mask, not ha any, even the way people might have viewed me previously. Mm -hmm. um, even that wasn't, you know, I realized that, that I wasn't that person. What does it mean to walk around in this world without the mask? Well, the way I experienced it was, number one, really freeing. Freeing because internally there was no sense of I have to be somebody, either somebody for myself, I have to be the person that, as I'd like to see myself, and I don't have to be a person for anybody else. I knew very deeply that whoever I might be pretending to be wasn't going to be real, wasn't going to be authentic. For, for some people, that's very, very frightening. For me, it was very liberating. It was like having taking a weight off that I didn't even know that I had been carrying for you know, probably most of my life. So it was a feeling of great psychological, emotional, you almost even physical buoyancy, you know, a, a, a lightness, a lightness of being. Um, it was, it was delightful. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> so during this time and shifting, you, you've come out of your 20s, you've come out of this relationship, you have this lightness of being. How'd you meet your future wife? Ah, I was, uh, it was actually a blind date set up by my sister, my older sister. Um, she knew she knew Mukti, um, mm -hmm. who was Annie at that time, and um, we were the only pe two people she knew in the entire world who meditated. And so she thought, "You guys, there's a connection. There's a connection. So you guys would be great together." And so we met. Uh, we met through through her. Very, uh, very, yeah, yeah. And kind of fast forwarding from there. 33, take us to 33 years old, St. Patrick's Day, luck of the Irish, and a call of the bird. Yeah. It's really interesting because, number one, my wife Mukti comes from an, an Irish family. Her father Im immigrated for, from Ireland. Her mother's father immigrated from Ireland. So there's a total Irish family. And here we are on St. Patrick's Day at 33 years old. And 
you know, from the time I was 25, I, I still had a very profound spiritual interest. I still had a very profound spiritual practice. And, and yet I wasn't pushing and striving because after 25, I knew that it's not going to get me anywhere. Mm -hmm. In many ways, that would have been a denial of everything that I had seen. Um, but yet I was, still was engaged because I knew I hadn't come to the, to the end of this, if you can even think of it in terms of an end. But I knew there was more. And so I sit down one morning. Um, I was going to go see my teacher. and I would usually get up early in the morning, like 5.30 or 6, to meditate for a couple of hours before I would go to her. And we'd meditate for a couple of hours and hear a talk. I just sat down to meditate, kind of like I did at 25, except without the angst. Didn't seem in particularly unusual day. And I just sat down. And as soon as I sat down, I heard just a, a little bird call outside. And this question came up from, it was really interesting because I could feel it physically rise up from, from like my guts and come into my mind. Instead of rise up from my mind, it literally seemed to rise up from somewhere right in my guts. And it hit my mind. And this little question just said, who hears this sound? And somehow, as soon as that question hit my, my consciousness, um, there was this sort of ground shift. And all of a sudden, I was, I was the bird. I was the sound. I was, I was whoever was sitting there. I was the atmosphere. I was, well, every, where I looked, everything I felt, I felt as if it was me in some very unusual way. It was... It was different from 25, because at 25, I mean, we didn't go into that with great depth, but that was a energetically explosive, in many ways, almost like a violent awakening experience. Was that like a it, kundalini experience? Yeah, that was part of it. A really violent kundalini experience that seemed like it was going to kill me. This was just like, oh. And it wasn't, there wasn't this, there was no great emotional explosion. It was just a very simple, but very profound, oh, oh, I'm the bird, I'm the calling, I'm the environment, I'm, you know, the whole, the whole thing is somehow mysteriously me. And, um, of course, there was a sense of, again, a sense of relief and kind of awe, mm -hmm. but also kind of oddity, like, this is odd, but no huge experiential byproduct, which was really looking back advantageous because I could really, I was really just with the insight part rather than how the insight made me feel. And so I wasn't distracted by a bunch of powerful emotive experiences. And, you know, I sat there for a while and then I got up and I put it to the test. And I thought, well, let me go around the house. Mm -hmm. Looking at everything I can look at, every inanimate object, you know, the stove. I mean, literally opened up the bathroom door and looked at the toilet. And I mean, I really like, like, let's see. And you're going, is this me? Yeah, is this? Like, how do I experience this? How do, how do I experience the stove? What is it like? What do I feel like? And somehow everything felt to be intimately and yet very simply, very, very obviously me. You know, in a way I couldn't even explain or justify to myself. It was just completely obvious. Um, and uh, anyway, that was that was in a very encapsulated form, at least the beginning of that unfolding. Thank you. And I want to dive into the book in a minute. But one one of the questions that really one of the real important questions I think to understand is. Having had these experiences, it doesn't mean that emotions don't rise up or that all of a sudden you're completely detached from everything, does it? No, no, no. I think that's one of the real, real misnomers. Um, there's, I think there's two big ones. Number one, that having these kind of experiences solves everything in your life. Right? Suddenly everything's fine and everything's perfect and you're perfect and, you know, that's one. <laughs> that's, I call that the sales pitch for enlightenment, you know, that it's going to work that way. You're still chopping the wood. Right. You're still chopping the wood. Um, um, in one sense, there's still, you know, there's still a human being there. And that human being is, is as, as human as they were, as they were before. Um, the, a big, the big part of the shift is how all that's experienced, how all that's related to. Sure, at least in my sense, I would say that 95% of angst 
what would call cause me angst or suffering or identification kind of fell away, never to come back. Um, and yet that doesn't mean that you never have an angry moment. That doesn't mean you never have a sad moment. If anything, it means those things can happen, but they happen at least experientially in this sort of immense, vast space that's completely okay with the, that moment. It's completely okay with what you're experiencing. And so at least my experience is all experiences kind of arise in that and they also pass through through this sense. It's completely, it's okay. So everything kind of becomes like a breeze mm -hmm. rather than a rock, rather than I'm upset and I'm stuck with it and it's, and I'm gripped by it. And you know, it's, it's like everything is um, fluid, sort of dynamically, dynamically fluid. And I think if, if this whole enlightenment thing meant that it's the elimination of a whole bunch of experiences, well, that would mean it would be a limitation. That, okay, I've eliminated a whole host yeah. of human experiences. It's the freeing up of experiences so that all experience becomes fluid and dynamic instead of so solid and entrenched. At least an, that's my experience. There's an important word you use with that, and, and this, this is beautiful, thank you, is, is judgment. You're viewing these things without judgment. The anger may still arise, but you're not attaching, I'm a bad person because of that. Right, right, right. There's no, there's no, there's no judgment. At least in my case, I just never had judgment about anything I was experiencing from that point on. There's no judgment and there's no a special meaning assigned to it. Meaning would be, I feel this way, therefore it means this about me. Mm -hmm. There's, each thing is just, it's like the rest of, you know, most of our experience for everybody, most of your experience unfolds, most of your perceptions unfold without judgment. You know, you're just experiencing a hundred things almost every minute that just kind of come and go out of your perceptual field and you don't have any judgment, you don't assign meaning to it, it's just what arises and passes away. It, but those things that our mind attaches to, that whatever it judges, you're stuck with. Right? It solidifies. It solidifies. It becomes really important. It becomes this massive part of your experience. Um, so yeah, um, my, in my experience, it's the the, lot, the judgment just sort of disappeared. The the meaning that is assigned to an internal experience just um, I don't know something about whatever it is that makes that kind of meaning and makes those judgments just. Um, Stopped operating that way. Awesome. From there, let's let's temporarily attach meaning to something as we're diving into your book here. The temporary attachment is why is it so important we wake up now? Mm. Well, <laughs> it's important. Number one, it's important if it's important to you. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't have some theoretical idea that it says that it's important for everybody to wake up because I don't have any idea what that would be like. But I think the thing that's that is important is I think that we certainly are at a point in our life as human beings and the, the immensity of the impact that we have on the world around us, on each other, we become exponentially more powerful almost every decade. You know, the, 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 the pace at which our technology is evolving, um, uh, that makes each of us exponentially more powerful, which means the, 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 the effects, the consequences of where we're operating from internally get amplified often through, 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 through the use of technology. And so the stakes are very, very, very high. In that sense, I think then it becomes really important that we, we wake up from our identification with thought, from identification with our own belief system, because we've got the means to empower our thoughts and empower our belief systems, and they have much greater influence they have, we are more powerful. So that means our illusions are much more amplified, much more powerful, have much bigger consequences. The positive side of that is, so does our wisdom and our love. 
and our compassion, right? Here are you are to dedicating your time and a good part of your life to doing this program, right? This is a, this is the part of a positive part that you are right now. You 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 are you are empowering your your positive intentions, mm -hmm. and you're utilizing technology to do that. And so it's not all negative or positive. It's just that as human beings, I think we have to come to a reckoning with we have all now have the means to be much more powerfully, much more influential than we did even a decade ago, much less 100 years ago. And that, that means we're much more responsible. And remaining asleep at the wheel, controlled simply by our identifications and our belief systems and our opinions, takes on greater and greater consequence as time goes by. Can you dive more into that? What does it mean to be asleep at the wheel? I think asleep at the wheel, first of all, it's, it's to experience and see ourselves, number one, to be our identification of being, who we see ourselves to be, to be limited to what we would call so our own, just our own sort of personal life, specifically our own personal belief system. Because this is what kind of comprises what I call the false self. False doesn't mean bad, it just means not ultimately true. And our ideas, our beliefs, our opinions, our past, our memory, you notice all this stuff is stuff that swirls in our mind, all of which we can forget in a second and then remember a second later. Mm -hmm. If we can re forget it and then remember it, it can't really be an accurate definition of who we are. So this, this whole complex, this sort of psychological complex, is comprises the, fa the, the false identity. Um, and so s s beginning to see through this, instead of judging it as good or bad or right or wrong, worthy or unworthy, if we can start to look at it as, is that really me? Do my ideas, do my belief, does my belief system, do all my images from my past, do the wise and unwise things that I've done in my life, does all that actually really define my own experience of the essence of me? You know, or is there something to give people an, a, just a sense of this? I like to create this image. Imagine that you had a whole week to tell someone everything you could possibly say about yourself, every memory you've ever had, every belief, every experience, good, bad. Everything you could possibly say to someone, they were there for you 24 hours a day to listen diligently in the way you always wished you were listened to. Now, if you could imagine you could get everything out that you could ever say about yourself at the end of that week. Now, would that person completely and absolutely know you? Mm -hmm. And see, I think most people intuitively would have some strange little sense like, yeah, there's something. There's something still that I couldn't communicate that isn't communicatable through my ideas and experiences and beliefs. And there's some, there's some sort of essence that would still be there. And that's sort of the intuition that there is both more to us and less to us than, than we imagine. How do we then learn more about either our true beingness or who we truly are? <laughs> well, how do we go about it is one way to go about it, I think one of the more powerful ways is to simply begin to unlearn who we think we are, right? To see that whoever we think we are, however we judge ourselves, no matter how that is, if we just see that all of it is sort of a passing imagination, a passing thoughts, passing memories, mm -hmm. right? And as they pass through our mind, as they pass through, there's something more primary. There's something that's there that's not defined by the next thought, by the next memory, by the next identification. There's something more primary. So in one sense, by doing that, we're starting to see, oh, I'm not that person that I thought I was. I'm not, that doesn't really define me. It's not like you're denying parts of yourself. It's just that you're seeing that doesn't, that's not a full definition. And by seeing that, by starting to sort of unwind our identity, we come upon this sort of hidden assumption 
that there is sort of this, if I do that, I'm going to find this like little guy or little girl, this little bean inside, you know, like the core of the onion, you know? Mm -hmm. And when we unfold the layers, what we realize is it was all layers. That the core is actually, there isn't actually a little entity in there called me. That the me was comprised only of layers. And when all the layers, when we see through the layers, in a certain sense, there's nothing there. We interpret that there's nothing there in a negative way, right? Intuitively, conditionally, like that's not good. But if we just were to notice, oh, there's nothing, there's nothing there. It's all layers. Okay, but what is it like to be the nothing that's there? So that's a little kind of positive twist mm -hmm. is what is it like to be the nothing that's there? Because then the nothing isn't just nothing, right? Here we are, and everybody that's listening to us is conscious. That nothing is very conscious. It's very awake. It's, it's, um, it's very present. So it's not your garden variety nothing. It's not simply nothing. It's something of great vitality, great aliveness, right? great sort of um, presence. So at once it's, it's seeing what we're not, but also it's starting to be honest with well, what's there. Even if what's there seems to be nothing, do I have the courage just to step into it metaphorically and say, well, what's it like to be that? Um, you might end up liking it. <laughs> I, I can't resist, but and, and I don't even know how this is a segue, a segue, but it came into my mind, Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> and he's trying to get this, this scroll that has, that has the, the recipe for becoming the dragon warrior. Mm -hmm. And on this scroll, when he finally gets this scroll, warning everybody, spoiler alert here, there's nothing on the scroll. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right. The secret is nothing. <laughs> the secret is nothing. Right. That's the, and the thing I think there's an unconscious fear of this, right? Because people, there's the unconscious fear is number one, that nothing isn't good, right? Because mm -hmm. we associate it with all sorts of negativity. But also, we can associate it with nothing means that I'm therefore going to sort of deny my human experience. And it ends up that when we really can experience that nothing nothingness or that presence to put it in a more positive way i suppose um that it's not a denial of the human being there's still a human being there right it's like there always was we're not dismissing any part of our of our human experience what it really does at least in my experience is it liberates or frees mm -hmm. the human experience to be what it is without the conflict right and what's sort of animating this thing and what even right down to the material form, but that can be a big jump. But certainly what's animating this thing is that nothingness. We can call that consciousness if we like. Mm -hmm. We can call it spirit, which was what they used to, they used hundreds of years ago when they sat around going, what do we call this experience of being that's not a thing? And somebody went, let's call it spirit. It's just another word for something that's nothing. Right. So we can call it lots of things. Um, but like I said, at least in my experience, it's a, not a denial of everything. It, if anything, it becomes the grand inclusion. Right? Everything is included. Or as my bird call revealed, everything is an expression of that which is nothing or that which transcends all the forms. So let's dive into the nothing. Let's dive into the everything. Let's talk about the three core practices and first off, the importance of meditation. Yeah. Well, meditation is really, well, look, number one, there's lots of ways of meditating, right? And there's lots of reasons for meditating. But if we're meditating for the reason or the purpose of waking up, mm -hmm. then, then we're, we're essentially involved in a meditation where if we're seeking anything, we're seeking to just be. So my way of explaining that is, what is it like if you sit down? and simply endeavor to let all of your experience just be the way it is, which is kind of revolutionary. What would that, instead of even trying to do that, mm -hmm. what I suggest is people have it as a question when they sit down and meditate, what would it be right now to allow 
every bit of this moment, every experience, no matter positive or negative, whether I like it or not, to be just the way it is. Now, any moment when we actually do that, or even come close to doing that, we experience a very quick sense of peace. Oh, even if you feel conflict, what's it like if I just allow everything, even my internal conflict, to be just exactly the way it is? Strangely enough, when we do that, all of a sudden, there's peace. That conflict is unfolding within a greater context of peace. And so I think of meditation as actually the art, because it is an art more than a technique. It's the art of doing nothing. And doing nothing is a is a very engaged art. Um, but that's essentially it, allowing everything to be exactly as it is. So what I can hear people behind me saying is, because there there is this desire in the mind to have all the answers, what's the next step in doing nothing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, when you're doing this, remember, you're not, even though you're allowing everything to be as it is, it doesn't mean that you're denying your core inspiration, right? what you really want to know, your core question, you know, whether it's what is life, what is God, who am I? It's not like you're, you're getting rid of that. It's just, it's a means to penetrate into this deeper experience of being. So when you very commonly get to a place and your mind will go, well, what's next? You know, how do I, what's the next thing that I do? What's the next thing that I engage in so that I get beyond this dreaded letting everything be as it is? <laughs> and at that oh, no. point, we just need to be like, realize like, oh, okay, that's just a, a deeper la layer mm -hmm. of unconscious resistance and fear. So you just let that be. See, there's, there's, there's an underlying insight. We're not letting everything be just because it's like a, a, a strange thing to do. There's a very specific reason why you approach meditation this way. The reason is, is because the truth of our being, what we really are, it's already there. We never become what we really are. Right? We already are what we really are. So since there's nothing to become, all the effort is always to become something or to stop experiencing something we're experiencing, right? So when we allow everything to be, what we're really just allowing to do is all of our resistance, we're allowing it, we're just allowing it to kind of fall away. Our grasping, right, what will I get out of this? When will it happen? We're seeing that just in the space of allowing everything to be in a very, very deep way. The idea is when we do this, the truth of our being is what will present itself all by itself. We cannot force it to happen. It has to present itself all by itself. But you can set the stage to where that is much, much more likely to happen. Beautiful. How long is a good amount, I'm, I'm circumventing the should word, is a good amount of time to start with just being? Great question. Um, I, would, I would say if anybody has not, has, has not tried to do this, has not tried to say meditation. Start with five minutes. And if you start to really struggle before five minutes, then go up to the point where you really struggle. In other words, don't push yourself into doing it a period of time where you get this very negative association with it. When five minutes becomes comfortable, then you go, I'm gonna let me try ten. When that becomes comfortable, you know, I would, I usually suggest nobody meditate more than about 40 minutes because even if you get very, very good at it, you can get kind of into this dreamy, somewhat drug-like space that can be very, very, very pleasant. But in the end, we're not looking for a dreamy, drug-like, disconnected state of being. Um, so it's, I think it's best to not, you know, not push, not do it too, too long. We want to remain kind of a feeling of, of, of um, kind of vibrancy, a feeling of awake. You know, meditation isn't to kind of sit back into a little bit of a drugged, you know, it, uh, a state. So, so I wouldn't go too long either. Thank you. From there, let's let's take the counterpoint. You say that inquiry is the counterpoint of true meditation. What's inquiry, and what does that mean? Yeah. Okay. Great. Great question. 
So where, where meditating, you could, you could think of almost as the, the yin, kind of yielding, soft, mm -hmm. open, expansive, right? Letting go of the personal will, all that kind of stuff. Its counterpart, its yang, or to yin and yang, its counterpart, which is more dynamic. So the inquiry, first of all, the inquiry has to connect the question. That's what inquiry is, asking yourself a question with a question that really matters to you. It can't just be somebody else's question, like, oh, I'll ask this because someone said something nice will happen to me. It, it's, your, it's an existential question, the really, really deep questions, like I said, the, the ones we're afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. Who am I? What is God? What is life? What the hell's going on here? You know, the, the deep questions that often feel too big. So. Number one, it takes some courage to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I'm gonna get in touch with the deepest questions of my, of my human life, right? I'm gonna engage with that question. I'm going to ask myself that question. So that takes some engagement, right? You're not just letting everything be. Now you're like, okay, I'm leaning into my, my deepest questions. I'm leaning into my own fears. So you'd have the question. The question then the question becomes, how do I work with my question? Very, very important, because usually when we have a question, we just sit around thinking about it all day, you know, or we get on the Internet, we read it. What is somebody else saying? There's a time to to use our intellectual capacities to kind of, you know, to whatever extent we can. But inquiry is really a way of gaining access to what's often a very unconscious part of our being, the essence of us. So the way I suggest that people work with a question, have your question, mm -hmm. but have almost the image like your mind or your consciousness, like imagine it's like a nice, well, like the lake that's behind you, <laughs> at least as I can see, a nice mountain lake, and you're out in the middle of the lake on a boat, and you have your most sacred, important question, and you really want some sort of resolution, not so much an answer, but a deeper resolution, a deeper insight. And that would, imagine it's like this little, stone mm -hmm. and you just place the stone on the top of the lake into your consciousness and you just let it go okay. who am i and you just let it go and let the question go in don't look for an answer just let the question go in and if you let the question go in very quickly what you'll feel is that the question has kind of taken you into this very mysterious place. Like, oh, as soon as I ask the question, I actually have an experience mm -hmm. of not knowing who I am. That's the place we usually run from, right? I don't know who I am. I don't know what life is. I don't know what God is. I have to figure it out. But an inquiry, we're going into that space and going, wait a minute, let me stop. Let me experience. Let me feel. What is it like? To not know, to really experience what it's like to not know who I am, and what's that like? Right. So the question is trying to get you to to that unknown experience as quickly and efficiently as possible. It's very useful to understand that. Mm. And number two is to understand when it gets you there. That's when you just let it be there. Let yourself experience not knowing. Because then you're very open to a deeper unfolding. You know, as long as we're in the known, and okay, I've got all the answers. I looked on the internet, and it says I am consciousness, or I'm awareness, or I'm this, or I just said I'm that. We're in the world of the known. When we're in the world of known, we're locked. We're still locked in the mind, right? But when we use a question to introduce us to the unknown, we're very open again. In that openness, what does that openness feel like when you go, I don't know? Oh, how does that feel? Oh. And at that moment, you're in a state that feels very much like when you allow everything to be as it is. See, so that's where inquiry and meditation, that's where they meet. And they're kind of two different ways to access the same place. I find both of them, one which is sort of yielding and easy and soft, and the other which is more active and engaged, that both of them, you know, utilizing both of them is more powerful than either one of them on their own. 
you know, because just meditation, sometimes it just leads yeah. you to nice states of being, but no insight. Just inquire without meditation or without a meditative approach leads you just into a lot of intellectual understanding or confusion. You combine them, and in my experience, they tend to be much more powerful. They, they work off of each other. Beautiful. Thank you. Is there one more third component to this? Well, I think the, the third component is, again, it can be not this third component isn't necessarily for everybody. The third component is sometimes we'll hear or read something. I mean, this is one of the ways that sacred scripture can be used for, but it doesn't need to be sacred scripture. Um, but it can be a statement, right? It can be, um, like I said, in, in, in a lot of the contemplative traditions, they might take a little, little piece of scripture, like literally a sentence or a half mm -hmm. sentence, and just drop that into their being in the same way you drop a question into your being. So, for instance, one of my favorite Indian sages, it's no longer alive, but Nisargadatta, his, his teacher told him, you, you, you are the fundamental reality. You are it. And so he said, I believed him, and I did nothing but meditate upon that. That's all I did. And so it wasn't like he would sit there and say to himself, like a mantra, I am the fundamental reality, I am the fundamental reality, you know, because then you're just imposing an idea. Mm -hmm. But it's like you're taking that idea and dropping it inside and, and just letting it kind of go into your being, which is kind of into your unconscious, and seeing what that um evokes right because this is kind of uh this this then would be the the practice of the ideas that evokes a deeper response you know and seeing seeing what some of these deeper more more realized statements what they evoke with inside of you beautiful so if you have something like that that resonates then you can use this if you don't find anything that really resonates then don't worry about it then, you know, the inquiry is, I always see the meditation and the inquiry are as the two most powerful tools in your sort of spiritual tool, toolbox. Awesome. In fact, on the spiritual toolbox, I want to take off my coaching hat right now. I want to put it on you. I don't want people to leave today. I think you talk about it as, as what is it, uh, spiritual window shopping. I, I don't want people to just have listened today without taking action. What yeah. one homework assignment would you give people today? Okay. Well, the number one uh, homework that I would give someone today is, before I give you the homework, I want to give a really quick context. And this is that each person, each person, each person's life, life belongs entirely to them, mm. right? So you're not chasing somebody else's insight, because how do you know if it's actually true for you or even relevant? So I want to know, number one, what is it, what's the, what's the deepest question in your, in your life? Or when people come to me to hear me, I often, the first thing I ask them is, what are you doing here? Why are you here? What's driving your, your own interest, your curiosity? If you're in a spiritual search, what is it that you want to know? Connect with that. Not what somebody else tells you it should be, but what's intrinsically yours right that's number one so once you get to what's intrinsically yours mm -hmm. i think then to just take these moments through the day where you take to define like what's the really important thing what's the important question that i have right now if i could put it into a one word statement what would it be let me remind myself of that because life is a complete is a constant distraction from these kind of existential questions so let me just remind myself of that a few times a day and then let me just take a moment as i remind myself of that to just let this moment just to be the way it is and you can do this you don't have to be meditating to do it you can be driving the car you can be walking down the sidewalk you can be literally doing anything and you can have the question, don't make it into a demand. The demand would be, now I have to let everything be as it is. No, 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 no. Ask, make it a question. What happens right here, right now, in my experience, 
when I even begin to let this experience be just the way it is. Let me find out. And that with your own question, very, 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 very powerful. And you can recall a, either one of these things at any time. And literally checking in in this way mm -hmm. that could do, be done in as little as 15 seconds when you get the hang of it or 30 seconds. If you did this literally only twice in a day, after a week, you would realize that those 30 seconds, so twice a day, you've done it for one minute a day out of 24 hours, you will notice after a week that your experience of being has already begun to change. It doesn't, it's not like it takes hours and hours and hours. You just, you're just being, it's a way of being completely available to life, really is. That's what you're doing. 15 seconds twice a day where you're going, am I asleep or am I awake? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Or even, or there's one last one that I might give you that's even more direct that I can yeah. give to people. One I like to give out to lots of my own students, which is in your experience, so you're not thinking about it, in your experience, what is it that's looking out through your eyes? That's a mind blower. What it, what's your experience of that? You see, and then you're not trying to define it. You're just experiencing what is it that's looking out through my eyes. And again, when you ask the question, take those 15 seconds, that's not much, to feel it, to experience what is that that's looking through my eyes. That's, I mean, I, I, I really can't get much more direct than that. If people take that one and draw it to the logical conclusion, it's huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's huge. It, it literally opens up. Oh, <laughs> it opens up infinity, really. Yeah. So from there, a few quick wrap-up questions and maybe time for a brief meditation. Jessica, my wife, she's the producer. We also met in meditation. She, she, um, she wants me, uh, always wants me to ask a question for parents and their kids. What advice would you give parents today to help their kids along this journey? Mm -hmm. I get asked that question a lot. So to every parent out there, first thing I want to say is I'm not a parent. Right. So I like to always. So I don't know. Exactly, I don't know. I don't have your experience of being a parent. I, it's always really important. Yet I was a kid. And being a being a child is a very universal experience. And what gives any child the greatest foot in life, the greatest support in life, I think, is universal. And as a teacher, boy, I can't tell you how important I've seen this. If you can be that one person in a kid's life that somehow may, makes them feel like there's one person in the universe that unconditionally loves them as they are, not as they could be, but as they are, and somehow makes them feel that. If you can be that person, if the child receives that from anybody in their life, they have a foot up in life unlike you can't believe. It sounds cliche, but I can tell you doing this for 21 years, anybody that's had anybody that did that, a parent, grandparent, a teacher, even a friend who's received that in their life, it's, it's, there's nothing as valuable as that. That's infinitely more valuable than all the spiritual religious talk you could ever have in your whole life. Somebody has that. Um, there are doors inside of them that are wide open that um, are just amazing. Woo! Thank you so, so much. On that note, what personally brings you the greatest happiness are what I call the woohoo factor. <laughs> Well, the first thing that comes to mind is any time I've ever been privileged enough and lucky enough to be there when someone touches upon their true nature. I don't know that much in life makes me a whole lot more happy than that. That is like sharing in a, it's like sharing just in the most profound, pivotal moment of 
someone's life. I suppose that's probably one of the reasons I do what I do. Awesome. On that note, what's the inner revolution or any last words of wisdom you'd like to share with people? <laughs> that's a great question. I get that question a lot at, at the end. Um, this is number one, to simply attend to something as simple as what's looking through my eyes. What is that? Without even knowing it, you are you are dealing you're touching into a realm of your being that has the potential to completely revolutionize the way you experience yourself and life that is it seems so simple because it's so obvious right whatever it is that's looking through our eyes it's always there we don't have to create it we don't have to go looking for it it's right there but somehow attending to the experience of that has a revolutionary power in someone's life unlike about anything that i've ever seen you know it's it's funny you pay attention to the you pay attention to your own attention and it ends up to be the most powerful thing you can imagine beautiful thank you where can people go to find your beautiful books and to find out more well i suppose the, the easiest way is they can always go to well, the website um, adishanti.org, I think it is. <laughs> I believe so, yeah. Um, and, you know, of course, you can get all, all, the, all the books and everything on Amazon, but you can also get them on our website. And on our site, um, we also have a lot, many, 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 many hours of audio and video that's free. It doesn't cost anything. We have things that are there. Anybody that if they wanted to, most people that come to see me in person have literally seen dozens, if not hundreds of hours of me teaching just by going to YouTube because people put stuff of mine up on the web constantly. Um, so um, so I, I always like to have people like be able to be introduced to something that doesn't cost them anything that they can participate in as much as they want. Like I said, if you include YouTube, there are literally hundreds of hours of video and audio tape of enough to make your eyes cross. Put <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So if you didn't catch that, everybody, go on over to adyashanti.org. And if you didn't catch adyashanti.org, come on over to inspirenationshow.com and we'll get you over to adyashanti.org. <laughs> Great. Great. Would you have time for a very brief meditation? So anybody that's with us, anybody that's listening to us, if you could just close your eyes for a moment. And as you close your eyes, just notice if there's any part of you that's waiting for anything to happen. Just notice it. If there's any part of you that's anticipating any kind of experience happening. If, and if you feel that, you just notice it and you just acknowledge it and leave it to be just, just as it is. And we're just sitting here together and we're wondering, not without thinking about it much, what is this moment like? What's my experience like? When I just allow this moment, and everything in it to be exactly the way it is. You're not even trying to do it. You're just posing the question and seeing what effect it has. And you notice that there's an underlying quietness. It's just there. It doesn't mean that there's necessarily no thoughts or no sound outside. But underlying it all is a kind of quietness. Quietness that you don't produce. You don't have to make yourself quiet. It's just something you notice. And you just take that moment what does the quietness feel like? 
and just feel it for a moment. And then you just notice that you're completely aware that without trying to be more aware, that awareness is just naturally present. It's just already occurring. So awareness and quiet is constantly a part of every experience. And all we're doing is having a kind of wordless acknowledgement of these qualities of being. Whether you know it or not, you're actually beginning to rest more into your true nature. Into what's there before you think about anything. Notice how your awareness and the silence, it's not in opposition to anything. Your mind may or may not like what you're experiencing, but the awareness and the quiet is not even in opposition to your mind. So we're just ending this time together by this kind of silent acknowledgement of what's always there. Instead of constantly seeking for what's not. And that's our little meditation. <laughs> Adya Shanti, you are, Adya, you are a very powerful rock or tuning fork. You have taken us down. I'm usually over the top on this show, and I'm in a very calm, blissful ah, place. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, Michael. It's really a delight to be to be with you. I really, I really appreciate you. It it most certainly goes both ways. Gotta crank it back up for the finish now. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the way of liberation, and begin discovering your true self today. And shine bright. Thank you so, so much. You're welcome, Michael. It's nice to meet you, too. I really, oh. I really enjoy you. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>